While the Holocaust is the main focus of the annual program, the Memorial Week regularly includes events that are devoted to a different, to various different genocidal campaigns. And in this sense, it really is a study, if you will, of comparative genocide. Just to give you some ideas, uh, the program that we have for this year's Holocaust Memorial Week includes several different speakers. And I would just like to go over the program with you so that you have an idea of what this week will hold. To begin with, we began today at 4 p.m. in the Native American Longhouse with the O Project in Oral History, Healing from the Cambodian Genocide. And I want to give a special thanks to the Oregon State University Cambodian Students Association for participating in that discussion with our campus and educating our campus and Corvallis community about the Cambodian genocide. Specifically, I would like to give a, a, a special thank you to Soho Iyad, who was an OSU graduate and former vice president of the ASOSU. And Soho, I'm going to embarrass you, but I would really like for you to stand and, and for everyone to give him a round of applause. let you know that tomorrow evening at the Dark Side Cinema at 4 p.m. there will be a film, Landscapes of a Mind Memory, The Life of Ruth Kruger. This is a noted Holocaust survivor. And the film, film deals with the issues about re revisiting significant places in her life. Uh, Tuesday evening at 7.30, we will have Ruth speaking about the show up in fiction. Following that will be Wednesday evening at 7.30 in the same location, a public talk by Peter Hayes, who will speak about from Aryanization to Auschwitz, German corporate complicity in the Holocaust. This will be followed by a Thursday evening presentation by Henrik Grinberg, who will be speaking about bearing witness through literature. And then on Friday, we will have an all-day uh, symposium from 10.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. in MU206, the Social Justice Student Conference. And this will be an opportunity for students to present some of their research that deals with themes of social justice. So at this time, I would really like to change our focus and our emphasis to our this evening's speaker who is Dr. Alex Hinton. And Dr. Alex Hinton is the Executive Director of the Center for the Study of Genocide, Conflict Resolution, and Human Rights, as well as a Professor of Anthropology and Global Affairs at Rutgers University in New York. He also serves as the President of the International Association of Genocide Scholars. He is the author of the award-winning book, Why Did They Kill? Cambodia in the Shadow of Genocide. In addition, he has also edited and co-edited several collections. He is currently working on several other book projects, including a co-edited volume on the legacies of genocide and mass violence, a book on 9-11 and Abu Ghraib, and a book on the politics of memory and justice in the aftermath of the Cambodian genocide. He currently serves as an academic advisor to the Documentation Center of Cambodia, of Cambodia and on the International Advisory Boards of the Journal of Genocide Research and Genocide Studies and Prevention. In 2009, Dr. Hinton received the Robert B. Textor and Family Prize for Excellence in Anticipatory Anthropology for his groundbreaking 2005 ethnography, Why Did They Kill Cambodia? in the shadow of genocide, for his path-breaking work in the anthropology, anthropology of genocide, and for developing a distinctively anthropological approach to genocide. Professor Hinton was a member 2011-2012 and now a visitor 2012-2013 at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. He has lectured about genocide, violence, justice, and the aftermaths of genocide throughout the globe. I would also like you to know that for those of you who may be interested after his talk, there are books outside to the right that will be for sale. So some of his publications will be here for you to purchase after his presentation. But it was it's a great honor and a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Alex Hinton.
Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thanks to all of you for coming, especially when the NCAA basketball game's on now. I'm worried that a few people, since I just said that, are going to stand up immediately and walk out. So, but from what I hear, it's a blowout, so no, don't worry. It's actually not try no idea. I'm not checking on my screen up here, so don't um, before beginning, um, I want to thank uh, you know everyone who's put this event together. Uh, you know, today, uh, Professor Kaufman spent a great deal of time with me, showing me around campus, and telling me about the work uh, that the Holocaust Memorial uh, Week Committee has done. As you just heard about the programming, it's really a tremendous event, uh, and something that's special, something that uh, does not take place in many other places. So it's terrific that you have this opportunity. Um, I was wishing I could stay for the rest of the week and go to everything else, but the last I can. Um, so anyways, I really want to thank all the organizers. Um, in addition, I want to thank the OSU School of Language, Culture, and Society, which is a co-sponsor. Um, and I also want to thank the people in the back who do the technology, which is the most important thing of all on the end, right? It's whether you actually get images up there. But I have to say that I was working on it on the train earlier, and you always have this fear that when you were working on it, there's a typo, so I keep, I mean, let me look back a lot, but I don't think there are any typos on there. Um, I'm going to, it'll be a PowerPoint presentation, uh, and I should, I'm going to clock myself, it should go on for maybe 45 minutes, 50 minutes, something like that. I can crash to a close because I won't make my point along the way, but I always think it's nice to have visual images to sort of highlight the points uh, that, um, that you're making. Uh, I'm assuming that many people aren't familiar uh, with the Cambodian genocide. Um, I don't know, there were some people who were at the uh, terrific event earlier uh, about the o Pro OH project or O project? OH project, oral history, you can figure that out. If you haven't seen the film that was made, I really encourage you to, uh, to contact him and find out some of this remarkable thing. A uh, group in Portland uh, has been working on this for some time now. Um, but I, I see some familiar faces, and I know some of you went there. Uh, but it really gives you a different sort of texture. I'm going to be talking uh, largely in sort of an analytical level, and there's something to be said, you know, tomorrow's talk will also highlight that, about an experiential level, and the two go well together. Though I'm going to try and bring in some artwork along the way and maybe we'll get at that a little bit. So to begin with, just terminology. So I, I may say, oh, sorry, well, I wanted to up here, but before we get there, <laughs> So coming up from the grave, they say he has a he's buried, there's a strong spirit. People actually go there and make pilgrimages there, and they think that actually it's a source of magical power. Um, it's sort of a different story. Um, that is true. Um, but he was the head of Democratic Cappuccia, and I might say DK for short. Uh -huh. DK, Democratic Cappuccia. I always pause because we start saying DK, everyone's forgotten, and there's a PRK, which is the government that came afterwards. But this would just be. DK, uh, and that's the period of Khmer Rouge rule in Cambodia from, and again, uh, April seems to be that month when everything happens, right? They came to power in April 1975, uh, and they were toppled in January uh, 1979, the beginning of January. Um, so, just a little brief background. How many people just uh, know about something about the Cambodian case? <coughs> oh, good, all right, so. Very brief then. And I should note that the photos that I have are from the archive of the Documentation Center of Cambodia, and I want to thank them for their permission uh, to use them for the presentation. Um, some of them also appeared, I noticed, in the, in the film as well. They have this terrific uh, archive of, of images. And this is one of them of Paul Pot. Um, so he was the leader of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, he just died. There's now a tribunal in Cambodia that's taken place. And the leaders, the senior leaders, uh, most of them have now died. Uh, a couple of them were killed. Uh, just recently, uh, Ing Sari, who was Pol Pot's brother-in-law, uh, he just died. He was on trial. Uh, the tribunal that's going on in Cambodia has some problems. Someone might want to ask me in the Q&A why it takes so long to have a tribunal. I'm happy to talk about that. I'm currently working on a book uh, on the tribunal on the first case. I'll talk a little bit about Doik and in the best 21 um, I'm writing a book about and hopefully we'll finish uh, by the end of the summer. When the Khmer Rouge came to power, uh, one of the first things they did is they ordered the population to leave the city. 
uh, as, as I mentioned before, in April, which is the hottest month in Cambodia, sweltering heat. Uh, you can sort of imagine if everybody uh, here said, all right, everybody out of their homes, you're going to leave for a few days, uh, you know, get out of here, everyone goes into the roads. But this, in Phnom Penh, there were about three million people because there had been a civil war going on uh, since 1968. Uh, and so in this case, I mean, three million people coming out of a city that was built for about a million people. Uh, so people died along the side of the road. You can see uh, the parasol umbrellas in the background because of the heat. Um, right now at the tribunal, the major, well, one of the major charges is the evacuation of Phnom Penh. They split the case against the senior leaders who are on trial. They've broken it apart, and they're actually trying them on the evacuation of Phnom Penh and other urban centers, as well as, well as population uh, movements that took place. Oh, I, you know, I always say, if you're interested in Cambodia, uh, don't worry, I often hit the up button and the down button, so I move back and forth a little bit. Um, but if you're interested, there's a good website. The court has a website. Uh, something along well, the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Uh, right, it's now for it says the ECCC, or the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, but they have a really good website, lots of documents. I'm going to show a couple documents that I have. Uh, on the screen a little bit later, uh, you can go there. There's also a very good uh, website that has a daily blog from the tribunal. Um, I think it's www Cambodia Tribunal, and there may be a monitor after the tribunal, but it's one of the two, but it's called the Cambodia Tribunal Monitor. So if you're interested in keeping up on what's going on, uh, you know, there's whatever happened in court, uh, they're ahead of us by about 12 hours. Well, actually, that's East Coast time. Don't ask me to figure it out. Is it 15 or is it uh, 15 from here? Okay, so anyways, you can do the math, and usually when you wake up in the morning, you will already have a blog report of what happened that day in Cambodia. You can watch actually telecasts, um, YouTube, the things that go on. It's really quite remarkable, and they've declassified a lot of documents. So for those who are writing on this, uh, there's a whole trove uh, of materials that are out there and available. <laughs> so when the Khmer Rouge came to power, um, one of the first things they did was to break apart different social institutions that constituted a potential threat. Buddhism was one of those institutions, so they uh, killed uh, some of the senior monks. Uh, they also forced monks to defrock. Uh, but ultimately, you can see as this picture shows, you know, you had the destruction of Buddhism. There were some interrogation centers and prisons that were opened up and hospitals. Uh, in different pagodas. Um, so they destroyed Buddhism. Uh, they took a part in the family, uh, where people had eaten together, worked together in the family unit, in the village unit. Uh, they disassembled this and created cooperatives so people would eat communally, uh, and they would work in sexually segregated teams for the most part. Uh, so again, the family splinter, uh, the anka, uh, the, which was a, a sort of a euphemism, for uh, whatever the next level of leadership was, going all the way up to Pol Pot, uh, would uh, marry people. So you would be married in the name of Anka. Uh, and sometimes, and there's a lot of variation in patterns, of course, in Cambodia. Uh, but a lot of times, the state would then marry a couple, and they uh, sort of get together and consummate that relationship. And then they go off to work and maybe not see each other for you know, months at a time. Um, so Cambodia, as you can see, you know, was radical transformation. Another thing they did is a Marxist-Leninist regime uh, is, uh, again, you know, in terms of religion, religion was considered the opiate of the people, uh, and that's another reason that we had that attack going on. Uh, the Khmer Rouge decided that they would implement uh, the, a super great leap forward. So it's not just a great leap forward, but a super great leap forward. Uh, and the use of that language was intentional. They were going to uh, reach a state of socialism and communism more rapidly than anyone else. They were going to beat out China, they were going to beat out Vietnam, uh, and they were going to do it super quickly. So they immediately abolished currency. Okay, that's it. They blew up the bank. Yeah, so there's actually a photo of the bank blown up that you can see. I actually meant to include it, but I forgot to bring it along. Um, currency exchange on the local level was banned. You could be killed if you were, even though there was some, uh, you know, 
barter that was going on on the backstage where people would, you know, for a tablet of penicillin, they would give whatever gold they had. So we had some of this exchange going on just a little bit. You could be killed for it. So no money, no markets. Everything was collectivized. Everybody worked for the state, and they worked long hours, uh, and they did so on starvation rations often. And here is a shot. This was done for a foreign delegation, so these are actually people are dressed up and everything looks fairly good, but it gives you a sense for the scale of the projects uh, that the Khmer Rouge uh, implemented, uh, massive agricultural projects, uh, but also they would do things like dig dams and canals. One of the legacies, and that's in terms of this week, of what happened um, is, and I'll be telling a story as I go along, uh, as you had uh, a massive, a massive death toll. Numbers, you know, nobody knows for sure. Doing the demographics is hard. If you find a, a site of mass graves where you had a prison and a hospital, you, know, you can even begin to count. There's some forensic, uh, some people working forensics can do, even then, so whether the people die of starvation, they die of disease, or were they killed? Sometimes you can't tell. So they're different estimates. Um, you know, now it's sort of, you know, the moment, people tend to say 1.7 to 2.2 million Cambodians died in that very short period of, I always forget, the, in Cambodia you can ask people will say it's three, three years, nine months, X number of weeks, and so many days, I, I can't quite remember what it is, but in a very, very short period of time. Cambodia's population at the time was about 8 million people. So that's one out of four. So look around the room and imagine one out of four people disappearing from the room. Right? And it's, uh, it's devastating. Of those, how many were executed? We don't know. Hundreds of thousands of people were executed within that. But many more were worked to death, starved, right? Or got diseases. And this shot is from uh, Chung Ai. How many people? Have people been to Cambodia? Anybody been to Cambodia? Very small number, and so most people who go to Cambodia will go to Tool Slang, and they'll go to Jungai. Jungai comes just there in February now has an audio tour, which is a very strange experience. It's very well done, but it's very odd. So you can hook up for the young generation; they're all I this, I that. But for me, it was a traumatic experience. I had to try and get mediated <coughs> through an audio tour. Um, but if you go there, you know it's very well done with different vignettes from people. Um, but when you know I went there, it was just dry. Uh, you, know, you taste the dust and you're walking on a mass grave site. Uh, somewhere between 10 to 15,000 people, nobody's again quite sure uh, as the bodies haven't been exhumed, uh, were, were, uh, were taken from the site. The institution is called from which they came. It was actually an old Chinese graveyard. That was part of There's a long story to why it was selected. Um, but uh, they came from this place called Tool Slang or S21, now it's known as Tool Slang, uh, but there was a primary school called Tool Slang at the time, where the name comes from. Uh, during the Khmer Rouge period, it was S21, uh, and it was a central security center. Um, how many people have been to S21? Same, so people go through there. Yeah. So if you go to Cambodia, you will definitely go there. Um, this is what it looked like when it was discovered shortly afterwards. Um, there's a long, interesting history about the discovery and the creation of the site of memory at this place. Uh, I don't have time to go into it, um, but it was transformed into this. And you can see the different school buildings, right? So that is uh, building A, you see on your, straight ahead of you, and on the right is building B. Building A was uh, a lot of special prisoners were held there. There were larger rooms and there were prison cells in building B, C, and D on the different floors. The person who ran this camp, his name was Comrade Doi, uh, and here's a shot of him. Uh, he's the person who first went on trial, and he's the person about whom I'm writing my book right now, uh, sort of watching his path into the revolution, uh, and trying to figure out why he did the things that he did. He says that he apologized to everyone and said, you know, I'm responsible for the crimes, but I'm following orders. So you always get that, I'm following. I was following our orders, I had to do it. So in this case, he apologizes and all 
almost every time so I, I, I take responsibility. Um, he also converted to Christianity uh, in the 1990s. Uh, so he's a complicated and interesting person. He's a former mathematics teacher. Um, anyway, so he headed Tool Slang, and when prisoners arrived, uh, they had their picture taken, and this one, uh, you can see how right, the person, other person's blindfolded. You can also imagine a lot of people who were brought in by truck and were shackled, you know, they bounced around in the truck, they'd arrive, they'd take it into a room, suddenly the blindfold comes off and your photograph's taken. So, you know, eyes dilate. So if you see uh, tools, the Tool Slang Museum has thousands of these mug shots that are on the walls, and a lot of times you see the eyes and they're sort of blazing, and you, know, to, you don't know the backdrop, you can't totally understand what's going on. Um, but this, anyway, sort of shows that people, at certain points, they received different types of numbers. That's a, sort of a long story. Uh, but people in general had numbers. Later on, they began to say what their name was on the on plaques that people would wear. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is Bu Meng. He is a survivor of tool slang. Um, as a youth, uh, he went to a pagoda, as many Cambodians of his generation did. And at one point, uh, he tells a story, there's actually a book that's done by the Documentation Center of Cambodia about uh, his life and his biography and his paintings in it. Um, I don't remember the title of it. Uh, but if you go to www.dccan.org, yeah, you can find it there. Uh, Umeng, uh, another long story, also sells his book at Tool Slang now. So for those who went to Tool Slang, it's possible someone picked up a copy of this book. I don't know. Um, so he started off, the, the monk at the pagoda gave him a pen because he was scratching in the sand and he started to learn to draw. Uh, later, he uh, would paint placards at movie theaters, which you find in Cambodia. So there he's painted a representation. This is from a sequence of, I think, 100 I can't remember the exact number, of 100 paintings, something like that, that depict his life over time. So these are snapshots that I'm, I'm showing you. And this shows, he's representing how he learned to paint. In this picture, uh, he is arriving at Tools, at the Gates of Tools Slang with his wife. They were taken inside, and here's his uh, depiction of uh, his wife having her photograph taken. He was then placed eventually, he was separated from his wife. Uh, he would later find out that his wife was executed. Uh, he, there's a picture of him in the cell depicting uh, his memory. You can see he has a shackle on, a spoon and a plate. Uh, in the background, there's a, often a US ammunition cannon to which people would uh, urinate uh, the bottle in the back of the ammunition cannon for defecation. Uh, so if you go to Tool Slang, you'll see the little cells and some of those, they still have the different U.S. ammunition cans. Uh, prisoners would go in, you know, it's, again, not the, not the exact focus of what I'm talking about, but it's related, so I won't go into all the details of your relationship, what happens to people who like to talk about that, since that's a topic, focus of my current book. But people would be sort of separated out. Then they would be taken, and they would be tortured. Uh, there were different groups. There was a cold group. Right, a hot group and a chewing group. Uh, and you can sort of, those words speak for themselves in terms of the methods that were uh, being applied. So you would have the cold methods of talking and you'd work your way up depending on the response of the, of the prisoner. Most people were you know, beaten or interrogated. I mean, that was pretty basic to beat people, uh, often with a whip, um, to electrocute them. Uh, but there were other uh, awful things that took place. And at one point I'll talk about one, one of those briefly. Um, and the end result was that they wanted people to confess. Uh, the, in Cambodian language, the word for, one of the words for prisoner means you're a guilty person, right? You're guilty. So people would come in. There was this assumption at Tool Slang that had, if Anka had arrested someone, they were guilty. And so the purpose was to extract a history of their guilt from them. And people would be asked to write and rewrite their confessions. Uh, you know, they'd be you know, tortured, write. They didn't like what they were writing, they'd torture them some more. And they would keep going uh, until they would produce a document <coughs> along the lines of 
this. This document has a very interesting history. I don't have time to go into it, but it actually was used by Doig in his own defense to show that he actually was a pawn. So I don't have to walk. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. So this is Doig's handwriting right there. And up at the top is his superior, Son Sen. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's Doig, he gives it to San Sen, then it's sent to Pol Pot according to Doig, right? And see that check? The big shot checks off, and he says, send it away, send it to the east. It's important. And so you see this, the document, you see the different dates, right? It's circulating. So people are being tortured, they're producing a confession, they may ask them about it. I realized I could have actually used the pointer for that. The pointer, <laughs> now I gotta go back. Um, so people would, sometimes these things were a thousand pages long, sometimes they were typed, I don't have a document, but there's one order from Sansen to Doig saying, uh, you know, you need to stop uh, wasting all this paper. Right? Bureaucracy, confessions, paper, material, so they're no longer lies, but it's actually a bureaucratic paper concern. Um, sorry. So at the end of the Confessions, and again, the Confession itself mirrors revolutionary history, so if you joined the revolution as Doig did in 1964, uh, you would say in your confession that I joined the CIA, or maybe the KGB, or maybe the Vietnamese Secret Service in 1964, and so you basically get people writing a history of their lives where they just substitute in words like CIA, uh, you know, where they would have said I joined the Revolutionary Party. But the key part of it was, at the end, they would, they would have a list of their uh, of their string of traitors. That's eight, that's it. One, two, three, and so forth. These could go on. I think this one is just page one of the same person's confession who I just showed you, Long Moi. Um, but he was from the translation unit. He translated from Chinese to Khmer, and that was a position that certainly can get you in trouble because if you something bad happens, you can be blamed, and this guy was blamed. Uh, but this is, you know, I think he has 60, 70, 80 different names uh, that he has in this confession. Uh, Anyways. Like I say, so Doik was using this cover page in his, as evidence. If someone was tortured, it was used by Doik to prove his effectively that he was a pawn, which is a very odd thing. Anyway, so sort of moving, and then we're going to get towards perpetrator motivation, which we're slowly moving there. Um, but so Bu Meng, how did he get there? Uh, Bu Meng, as I said before, was able to paint. So there was a day in which uh, basically, Doig said we need people to paint pictures of Pol Pot or with other people who can make a bust of Pol Pot. Um, there was a need for someone to fix generators. So a handful of people, right, and there is a picture of many of the survivors. Some people say there were more. Uh, the person who is on your, right, that's Bu Meng, that's Van Nat, another painter, uh, and John Dai, and I'm trying to find Jim Mai. I think that's Jim Mai. Those, those are the three survivors. The three of them testified at the trial. The rest have died for the most part. There's one other, Norm Chan Paul, who was a child. He also testified at the trial. Uh, there was also, and so afterwards, some of these people came back to work at Tool Slang, the museum that was created on the site of S21. And as part of the museum, they had representations of what happened. So Van Nat painted this painting. Uh, Bu Meng said to him, uh, brother, comrade, paint me into it. And so if you see right there, everybody's the same height until you get there. And you saw that Bu Meng was kind of short. So he painted Bu Meng into the painting. So sort of little things like that that uh, I'll tell you about. This is something that you did more recently. Who knows before? Uh, well, there's the painting of Pol Pot. There's another one that he has that shows this painting side by side with him as a prisoner, uh, but even this one of Pol Pot. You know, he had a painted picture, so afterward he goes and slashes a giant X through it. Okay, so moving briefly to the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. I told you uh, a little bit about Doig. Uh, last year, just over a year ago, the decision on his appeal was made. It's a long, so a long, complicated story. At first, he got a, what people perceived as 19 years, and on appeal, he got life. Uh, and he was, uh, for different things, crimes against humanity, war crimes, uh, and a couple of uh, different 
uh, and victims related to the Cambodian Criminal Code. Uh, his, the tribunals, as you may know from the ICTR, the tribunals in Rwanda, former Yugoslavia, which are still going on. But people may or may not know that, but they sort of get a momentum going and last for a very long time. They're very slow. So there's the flow of Deutsch's trial detained in 2007. And he finally got a conviction in 2012. And this was supposed to be the easy trial. So now we have case two going on, and they've had to split it apart. Uh, there were four different people who were on trial. Uh, Ing Sari's wife, Ing Turit, was declared to have dementia, right? So she's out now. Ing Sari has died. Nu and Gia has left. Kusum Han's left. So there are two people, and they're still in this first chunk. Um, in terms of Doik, this gives you a very quick overview of some of the highlights of his life. Uh, he was born in 1942. He joined the revolution, as I mentioned before, in 1964. He attended school in Phnom Penh. San Sen was his teacher, right, the person whose handwriting I pointed out before. Uh, he was sort of his patron through time. Why did they kill strings of people? Because it was basically a patronage system. So you wouldn't, if you went and arrested a district head, you would then not just sort of arrest that person, but all the people linked to him. Right? So you and then Ken Mirror, you say Kasai, so it means Kasai, someone's string, literally it means string. It's their network. You would take entire networks out. And so that's part of the reason they were trying to get all these names. So, but Doik was part of Son Sin's string. Um, in 1975, he became the deputy chairman of S21. Uh, and in 1976, in March, he became the head of it. And uh, the stuff that happened is a long, complicated, interesting story, but not the one I'm going to really tell in depth here today. In 1979, he fled uh, with some of the prisoners and different guards uh, as the Vietnamese back an army, uh, it's somewhere between 100 and 150,000 Vietnamese troops uh, who were backing a small number of Cambodian troops. Some people say 2,000, some say 10,000, I've heard 20,000. Uh, many of whom were former Khmer Rouge who had fled during purges. Uh, they came in, they routed the Khmer Rouge from late 1978 into 1979. Uh, Doik fled into the countryside, he had an interesting career, he went to China at one point, uh, came back, eventually started teaching again, and he claims he split from the Khmer Rouge in the early 1990s, uh, and he eventually was found, quote unquote, uh, by a journalist who had a picture of him, said he wanted to confess and tell everybody about his sins because he had converted to Christianity uh, and uh, God had told him to confess. Some people believe him, some don't. Uh, you know, this is one of the things in Cambodia over time. People who talk about issues like this is Doik telling the truth. Is he saying this to get off? Did he become a Christian so he could wash away his sins? Whereas in Buddhism, whatever you do, there's a saying, uh, this effectively, your sins go with you like a shadow. You can never escape them. They're always with you. So whatever your actions are, they'll come behind your condition every future moment, right? Rebirth is the sort of most commonplace way of understanding that, but the, in the lifestyle, in Buddhism, every second, in a sense, the different components that constitute you come together and dissolve away. So in a sense, you're constantly coming into being, and permanence disappears, you're reconstituted. Rebirth is the most, that's sort of the life cycle version of that. So whatever you're doing is always conditioning your existence through time. Um, but that means effectively that what you've done, you killed 12,000, 15,000 people, you know, that's your karma. It's going to affect your rebirth and then, and your rebirth is not going to be good. Yeah. So Christianity does offer a way to wash away the sins. So of course, it's complicated now, but at least in the way that many Khmer Rouge understand Christianity and the way it's been presented to them uh, by people who are converting them in the countryside, it's sort of you can wash away your sins. And that's the way a lot of people understand it. Okay, so we have Doik. I'm sorry I can't give you the full Doik talk uh, tonight. I've got to write, you can read the book when it's done, you can sit out in a while, I didn't just say that, but uh, how do we tend to think about people like Doik? So I want to talk about four forms of what I call explanatory reductionism that are commonplace, that uh, all of us in some sense most likely engage in to some extent, including, including me. Um, the first two are kind of interlinked. All right, so it's going to be biological, evolutionary, psychodynamic, 
cultural and situational. Um, just to give you a sense, I, I don't know why, but popular culture, and if you think of one representation of uh, biological or evolutionary reductionism, we might say it's sort of it's the Lord of the Flies explanation, right? People, most people, I assume, have read Lord of the Flies, if not, I encourage you to read it. But you have these kids, the ultimate civilized British kids, they're on an island, and suddenly all the veneer of civilization disappears, and their true inner biological nature comes up. They start carrying around spears and killing each other, right? So civilization dissipates, and suddenly savagery emerges. This one, again, you get it all the, all the time. I'm not going to go into all the text uh, on the side. But it's sort of the perpetrator is savage. It's linked closely to another one, which I call the psycho-explanation, right? Norman Bates. Do people still watch Hitchcock? I hope so. <laughs> College kids here. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because I don't want to know the answer, actually. But if you haven't seen Psycho, please go see it. Um, but the Norman Bates, right, is the psycho. It's that inner deviance within that's waiting to emerge and to break out. It's the trope of the monster. That person's a monster. And you get this all the time in depictions of different perpetrators. Uh, you know, the SS, for example, sort of monstrous, sadistic uh, guard. But it, it bubbles up all the time in explanations of perpetrators. And not surprisingly, it popped up with Doig. Um, so I give you many, many examples of it. It was mentioned in court. It was mentioned in newspaper headlines, uh, but you know, here's one. Comrade Doig, man or monster, right? Uh, there was someone else who wrote, sorry, the day I met, met a monster. Uh, it goes on and on, and even one person at the trial, book, Francois Bizot, has a book about meeting Doig. Uh, he has something, uh, he mentioned monster uh, in court, but he interrogated the notion. He's a French ethnographer. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on this, but you can also see this is a painting of tool slang that was done. And you can see how right, his body, his photograph is taken and he's made into the monstrous. Another explanation, what we might call the tribal hatreds explanation, or cultural reductionism. And this one you can see, especially it's often linked uh, to Africa. Right, in different places in Africa, so you've got sort of a tribal bloodletting, you've got it sometimes in Bosnia as well. Um, one of the ways in Cambodia that it's been, in many other countries, that it comes out is through notions like a culture of violence, like we say, a culture of violence, which now is often more nicely depicted as a culture of impunity, which codes a culture of violence, but it doesn't use that word because you know, it's not good to say this culture is violent. So people will now talk about a culture of impunity, or in another form, people talk about the lack of the rule of law. Right? So you found the pogs out there, you sort of know the opposite. You don't have the Leviathan, you've got anarchy going on. Right? So again, it sort of harkens back a little bit to, uh, in some sense, the notion of there's some sort of more primitive state that people are living in. Uh, in Cambodia, if you look at images in the media, you often, you often find a skull, you find this with Rwanda as well, where you get a sort of image of violence that's often next to a media representation. I, I can't say for sure, but I think if you went on your smartphones right now, don't do that because I know you'll check the, the basketball score, so not, don't do that. But if you were to do it, I suspect if you pulled up articles, Cambodia, they popped up, you would have half of them or more would have skulls next to them. Right? The main thing people would be talking about would be the tribunal, genocide, uh, or once in a while you get something like Jungle Girl, who tied Nancy Pelosi for the most uh, Yahoo story, who was a feral child that was found in Cambodia. Um, or there was the one about uh, when Cambodia building got an escalator, and they talked about that one person who didn't know how to use the escalator. And talk about other people who did know how to use it, of course, they focus on the one who doesn't. Right? Again, Cambodia is backward, primitive. You get this notion of sites of genocide as a culture of violence, right? It's essentialized in the culture itself. The fourth model that's often used is uh, you know, one that's a little more complicated in some ways, but we might talk about this as the banality of evil, explanation, or situational reductionism. And I don't want to oversimplify you know, on a rinse argument 
uh, or Milgram's experiments with Lombardo, but I think there is, there is a sense in which there's an explanation that people do the things they do because of the situations they occupy. Right? And this has come out certainly in explanations that perpetrators have given, including Doig. Uh, so we get this notion you know, of the monster, but he says, well, and his apology in the, in the third, uh, under the third bullet, I want to apologize. I'm very shocked to recall the orders to take lives that I carried out in force. I was a hostage and an actor. I did what I did because I occupied a position in a system, and I was a cog in the machine. And the cog in the machine argument doy, comes out all the time. So in the book I'm writing, one of the things I'm looking at is sort of this explanation to try and unpack it and say, how can we go deeper? Because it's a hard one. You don't know what's going on on the ground to really combat. Um, and I'll, later on, I'll come and I'll, I'll show you some organizational charts uh, in a little bit. Um, so here, you know, this is sort of, I can stop with this without going into some of this other stuff, but I'll just sort of say, in terms of thinking about perpetrator motivation, if you have a reductive explanation, right, it allies historical complexity, because if you, perpetrators are a bunch of sadistic monsters, what else do you need to say? If perpetrators are simply evil, what else do you need to say? We don't really need to talk about history or politics or complex contextual factors. They're washed away. They're sort of simple. Doig did it because he was a cog in the machine. In Cambodia, people killed themselves because there was a culture of violence. There was a culture of impunity. Right? So what we need in an explanation is something that takes account of, for example, historical context, historical process, not just talking about sort of ordinary men, to use the Christopher Browning phrase, but the why of motivation. Right? Why do people do the things they do? And that's a very complicated question. <clears throat> One I don't have a lot of time to go into today, but you can ask about it if you want during the Q&A. Um, so we need a processual model, a dynamic model, one that can take account of individual variation, because again, if you just have a bunch of monsters, it doesn't explain why people make different choices. Right? Choice is eliminated as a factor. Um, how there's temporal, contextual variation and change, how there's agency, negotiation. So one of the models in psychology, for example, that's come up is called an interactionist model. It just kind of says there's a person in a context uh, in a situation and actions proceed accordingly. If you're interested, some of this is in, you know, the sort of way I think about perpetrator mo motivation uh, is in a book I wrote called Why Did They Kill? Cambodia in the Shadow of Genocide. Um, I'm taking up a very different way uh, in the book about the tribunal. Um, but what one way to think about it is to think about the genocidal process uh, as a series of crimes, right? A series of things uh, that sort of coalesce together. Uh, I don't think you can ever say there are five causes of genocide. Right? Sometimes I think of it like, you know, cook. You have these ingredients, you chuck them into a frying pan, and maybe something cooks or the water boils, what have you. It may or may not happen. Sometimes the water may boil fairly hot, but not start actually boiling. You know, sort of predicting genocide is a little bit like that. You have a cluster of factors, and they come together, and you probably you have to have a sense for whether or not it's going to happen. And there, at the UN, <clears throat> there's an office, a uh, special rapporteur on genocide prevention, and in that office they have a set of predictors, and they put out genocide warnings. And of course, whether or not it's worked, we don't know for sure, because if you successfully stop a genocide, you won't know. <laughs> So I guess in a way there's never been a successful case of genocide prevention that we know about. Because it never became a genocide, right? So anyways, these warnings come out, you know, they've been given on Syria, uh, in different cases. There was one that was just issued on Burma, uh, but these you know these come out. So they have a, if you're interested, the UN office do the United Nations uh, Secretary General Special Rapporteur of Genocide Prevention, something like that. Uh, they have a website and you can you can look at this more. Um, so just quickly, in terms of Cambodia, to talk about these, you know, in many cases of genocide, I don't want to say all, because of course, if we talk about colonial genocides, right, there may be a different sort of constellation of factors versus ones that are more 
have more of an explicit, foregrounded ideological emphasis. Uh, so again, you know, you know, I just want to put these cautions in there. It's not a deterministic model. But especially with ideological genocides, uh, often you'll have some type of massive uh, socioeconomic upheaval. In Cambodia, uh, in the film today, uh, for example, that we saw during the, with the OH project, they talked about the Vietnam conflict. <clears throat> if you look at Deutsch life, and you sort of chart it, 1964, conflict in Vietnam is starting to escalate. He goes, he becomes the head of another prison camp, M13 in 1971. Right, so it's sort of his trajectory. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. He says that the reason he joined the revolution was to liberate Cambodia. Doig says that he basically was a nationalist. <clears throat> That's one of his things. He, well, he would give his life for his country. What he doesn't say is that, well, he says, but if I had actually not followed orders to kill people, I would have been killed. So that's a contradiction, right? On the one hand, he says, I'm a liberator, but yet he says, I was afraid of being killed. You know, so you get little things like this and explanations, and you know, is he lying? I don't know. Does he think that? Maybe he thinks that to himself. It's a heavy burden to know you killed, you were responsible for 10 to 20,000 deaths. So that's part of the complexity of Doik. Um, a second thing that arises is a uh, new regime will come in and they'll envision difference in a new way, right? They sort of think about the people as being parts in Cambodian. They would talk about elements. There are different elements. It's actually a Buddhist term. Uh, so you had a whole, they would talk about building, construction, uh, so there's this whole way that, you know, it was like a map in Cambodia, they would do irrigation projects with grids, and so you have this sort of high modernist, top-down imposition of an order. There's a blueprint for purifying society. At the same time as part of this, there's often a crystallization of difference that occurs where previously fluid boundaries harden, people were seen in different ways in the United States, uh, I often think of 9-11, in the way that someone who was Arab American or Muslim was perceived the day before 9-11 and the day after, right? You see that bar, that uh, very much on that one day, you can see how the, the boundaries between the groups are sharpened, people are foregrounded. This often happens as part of the genocidal process. In Cambodia, uh, you had one structural division was between new people, who were separated off from old people, uh, or base people and cadre. Um, but they had uh, other sorts of divisions. Here is a, uh, a representation, of course, who an enemy is may vary through time. So in 1971, Doig says that he was told at this camp in 13 to arrest spies. And they're always sort of knocking off uh, class enemies throughout the period, right? So you chip away at them. Uh, and they also had some select purges. These were people who were incarcerated there. At this first camp called M13. Then, in April, right after they took power, they started arresting uh, officials from the previous regime. So you had a first large wave of killing how many people? You know, we don't know, 200,000 maybe? <coughs> uh, former officers uh, from the Lon Mol regime, they were killed. <clears throat> March uh, 30th, there was a directive to smash internal and external enemies. And at that point, they started purging their own ranks in mass. And they killed class enemies. In 1978, there was conflict with Vietnam was escalating. Suddenly, they begin to look for Cambodians, they would say sometimes, who have Cambodian bodies but Vietnamese mines. And there was a massive purge on the east zone which bordered Vietnam. Um, there's one torture uh, that I probably don't have time to talk about. It's called paying homage to the image of a dog. And someone would literally have to get into a stress position 
before a picture of Ho Chi Minh or Lyndon Johnson. Right? So literally, you know, I talk about this as the mimetics of difference. They literally, your body is put into a position that makes you take the shape of the enemy other. And that's one of the ways in which torture and violence, people dismiss it as meaningless. Well, no, actually it has a meaning, and you can unpack those meanings. So there, in terms of differentiation of us and them, the Khmer Rouge had a, a thing called, literally, it was a magazine and a radio broadcast called Who Are We? That was the title, Who Are We? And they laid out us versus them, uh, and you'd always get <coughs> enemies planted within, burrowing from within, uh, and sometimes they would mention the different classes. This was 78, I believe, so you had the class enemies. Uh, but you also get the expansionist, annexationist Vietnamese, right? And as the conflict with Vietnam escalates in 1978, you get this more and more. So the next prime uh, is what we might talk about is the marking of difference, right? Where you take people who have been separated, like new people, and you mark them, you stigmatize them, you dehumanize them, you turn them into something that you get from that separation other than the us. Uh, and so as part of the marking uh, that you have, people, a new person might be more likely to be called a parasite. In Cambodia, you would sometimes say a plant parasite. Right? So we think of, for example, the Holocaust, <clears throat> often biomedical metaphors. You get some of those in Cambodia, but you also get things like agricultural metaphors. So you might talk about the husk of the wheat, right? And you separate from the husk. And so the good people, right, are like the rice that comes out, and then there's the detritus. So people might be likened to that detritus. Martin is different. Do you need detritus? No. Toss it aside. Uh, so you had enemies growing from within, and you have, you know, there's another way. You might just refer to someone with a diminutive pronoun. You might call someone via or a. Ah. You have ways in Khmer of indexing hierarchy and subordination using pronouns. So you might, you know, so all prisoners at Tool Slang were referred to as via, right? Which is a derogatory pronoun. It's almost an inhuman pronoun. Or a term like ah, which you might use with little kids or with animals. So through the use of language, you can mark people, stigmatize them. And all of these processes are coming together, right? You're marking people, you know, vision people is different. You crystallize the differences. The differences become marked. And then you organize society by creating spaces in which people are regulated, monitored, confined, separated, and prepared to be eradicated. So I mentioned before that I talked about the DK chain of command, right? So here, this in the trial, this was very nicely laid out. You can see the party center at the top. And there was a very explicit chain of command that went all the way down to the base level, uh, the communes. At each level, there were different militias, right? And at the zone, for example, you had zone security centers. You had important security centers at the district level. On the commune level, you had militia. And I heard that a while back there was someone who came and spoke about the chlop or militia crawling underneath houses at night and spying upon people. <clears throat> so you get these different levels of organization. Um, you get, again, this directive. This is a court document. You can download that from the ACCC website. It was brought up. This was a key piece of evidence, Doig said, this proves that I couldn't do anything because the four groups that received authorization to kill, right, were, if you look down in the second paragraph, right, the Zone Standing Committee, the Central Office Committee, the Standing Committee, and the General Staff. And he says, I wasn't any of those. So I didn't have the right to kill. But I think, anyways, there are lots of ways, this, there are other ways that you can say, well, he did have a lot of autonomy and did things. Um, but here, I just want to point out the right to smash inside and outside the ranks, to smash those hidden enemies growing from within. <clears throat> so, in terms of the organization of difference, how do you parse people? How do you confine them? How do you use different techniques to separate them out and prepare them to be annihilated? Well, so you have the security centers, you have re-education camps, 
And you had a series of practices uh, where people would write their biographies. I did put it down. Another one was in each village, each cooperative, the head of the commune had a ledger. And it listed a person's name, and it listed their occupation. And so you could say, there are three percent of the people are class enemies. We need to find them. And they would have the ledger, and they would go to the ledger. And there were also criticism and self-criticism sessions that took place, and you had constant surveillance. <clears throat> so again, the organization of difference, the state has a way to parse people, regulate them, separate them, and target them for mass murder. So we've sort of, you know, I've gone through this. Um, the mimetics of difference, I talked about in terms of the, uh, when the person would pay homage uh, to the image of the dog. Uh, here is, just briefly, a couple of other examples of the bodily inscription of difference. So here is a prisoner who is told to remove his clothes, right? So again, clothes, social skin, right? Clothes have meaning. They're symbolic entities. You strip someone <coughs> of their social being. You take off their clothes. Prisoners are a tool sling. Generally, only we're allowed to, men were only allowed to wear shorts. Women could keep, uh, could cover their upper torso uh, and wear uh, sort of a some pair. Um, so here it says on the night of, uh, of September 26, right, his clothes are taken off, uh, he's tied with his hands behind the back, probably like this, that's often the way it was done, um, and he remained in a stress condition. And they allowed mosquitoes to bite the person. What happens when mosquitoes bite you? Mosquitoes swell up, they're red spots. So what happens when your body starts to have red welts? Right? You don't look like a human being. You look like some sort of disgusting, sick entity, right? That's not the way people look. People get lice, skin diseases. Remember the picture of Boumain where he's all kind of shriveled up? He doesn't really look like a person. So you institutionally, within the organization, you create spaces where people come to resemble the ideological messages that have been asserted. So, someone's like a parasite. Well, they've got skin, their skin looks gross, they look like they're infected, they've actually got vermin crawling in their hair, right? So the state organizes difference in such a manner, and this all helps make it easier to kill them. Uh, you know, this is Gim Gai Gim Huid, uh, was another prisoner who was Doik's teacher. Yeah, Doik's teachers arrived at Tool Slang. Gai Gim Huid was one of them. He forced them to eat excrement. Right? The order of Deutsch says, well, I stayed away, I didn't want to see him, I was embarrassed. But there, you, know, you can see here, right? Deutsch's name is right up at the top. This is a message from, well, uh, it doesn't say, anyways, Deutsch's name on the, on the document, if you go back to that cover page that I said before, the document is sent by the interrogator to Deutsch, telling him about the torture of Geigen Hood, who he says wasn't really cooperating, he kept saying he wasn't a traitor. But then he was for, you know, so he says, well, so I forced him to eat excrement. What kind of a person eats excrement? Right? Someone who's not human. It's not something a human being does. So again, through these bodily techniques, you dehumanize someone, you mark them, you make it easier to execute them. They become something other. Uh, you know, so I've sort of like laid out this processual framework. Uh, you know, one other thing that enters into it uh, is an apathetic international response. Uh, it's highly debated now with the responsibility to protect uh, initiatives. Um, in Cambodia, you know, people knew that that stuff was going to be placed. Finally, this Vietnamese, uh, this huge number of Vietnamese soldiers with some Cambodians who had been purged and fled, uh, they came and they toppled uh, Khmer Rouge. People are often hesitant to say that they actually uh, prevented genocide, though some people have written this up as a case of genocide prevention. Um, so anyways, I promised that I would go for about 50 minutes, and that's just about where we are. So I think I will stop there, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to, uh, to answer them.